pals, greetings. Greetings and welcome. It is early January and I am speaking to you and that can only really mean one thing. The Montaigne Winter Spine Races are back on top of us again. They begin, in fact, at the end of this very week. Now, at the end of the 2023 event, that whole year ago, you'd have been forgiven for thinking, surely that's about as exciting as a spine race gets. You know, across all the distances, we had some amazing performances and records. And and then in the big race, that down-to-the-wire win um, with Damien Hall running against Jack Scott and then Claire Banworth coming in as winner a day ahead of her closest rival. Just astonishing stuff. So yeah, you'd have been forgiven for thinking. It doesn't get more much more exciting than that. And yet here we are. If you've had a look at the roster for the event starting this weekend, no doubt you've realized you were wrong and it can get better. We have over 400 entrants across all race distances. 177 on the start line of the big race, the uh, the Montaigne Winter Spine Race, doing the full length of the Pennine Way in just seven days. Among those, we have over 70 who are repeat offenders, who've been through this experience before and voluntarily came back to do it again. Uh, and then if you narrow it down even more, we've got a dozen runners out there who've been on the podium of this very race before. I mean, there are others among that that block of 177 names who've grabbed a podium place in some of the other distances within the Spinewind series or Summer series, but we're talking a dozen people who've been on this podium in the past. And then if you want to dig even further in, among those, we've got six past winners, two of whom are triple winners, which is astonishing stuff. I, who's going to win this year is absolutely anybody's guess. Now, as usual, on the run into a, a spine race, I like to ring around some of the athletes on the roster and, you know, see how their preparation for the event has been going. Try and gauge who might be feeling stronger, feeling more confident than the others. And every year, as I'm no, sure, uh, no doubt sure you're about to hear as you go through these episodes... Um, they edge around the point and don't commit to anything in particular, but who can blame them? They're about to go into an event where anything could happen at any time. Nevertheless, I've had a conversation with a number of the runners, and I think you're going to find it really, really interesting. Now, I've had to focus in on one race. Otherwise, this was going to turn into nine hours of podcast. So we are looking at the big race, and I know... There are names on that roster that you probably wanted to hear from who I haven't managed to catch. People have lives and it's not always possible to tie it together. So I don't want you to look at the list of guests on on these episodes and think, oh, those are the favorites for this race. I don't think you can have any such thing on a spine race. The conditions are so changeable from year to year that the conditions could play into the hands of any one of these athletes. But I have picked out some returning champions, some legends from years gone by, and at least one runner who's done exceptionally well in similar events and is coming to us for the first time. So I really hope you enjoy these episodes and I really hope you're going to be following those dots and looking out for those social updates across the whole of the race. Me and the Spine Media team will be there from start to finish and bring you all the news we possibly can. Now, I didn't want to subject you to, you know, six hour long episodes. Uh, so to keep these a little bit snappier, I've split the guests up across three episodes that we're going to put out over the next three days. And this first episode features a returning winner in Damien Hall, um, another returning winner in John Kelly, and an exceptional world-class ultra runner in Kim Collison, who we have seen run so well alongside Damien Hall in this race before and who we're all looking forward to seeing hopefully do well again this time around. I guess loosely, if I had to place a theme on this episode and explain why I've grouped them all in together, it would be rivalry. 
Um, you know, I've certainly tried to play into the uh, tea and hairdo based rivalry between at least two of these runners, but I think it'll become very apparent as you listen to the episode that um, you've really got to dig for the rivalry here. Um, if there's one thing that I've noticed across the entire ultra running scene is there are very, very rarely cases that I've come across of genuine angry rivalries. Maybe it's the nature of the events. Maybe it's the nature of the fact that these athletes all spend an enormous amount of time in very wild places, in very treacherous conditions, that they're all minded towards looking out for each other rather than fighting each other. That said, we are definitely going to see battle commence on the Pennine Way in just a few days' time. So let's hear from these runners. Let's hear how their preparation for the 2024 event has been going. And let's get properly excited for the Montane Winter Spine Races 2024. Good morning, then, to Kim Collison. Kim, uh, how are you doing this morning? How are you feeling? Good morning, Will. I'm feeling great. Um, looking forward to getting Christmas Day over and done with and enjoy the festivities because soon after Christmas comes the uh, spine. Um, and I'm really looking forward to mid-January and getting going again. Yeah, I, I can only imagine that it's even more amplified for you, but I've now got to a point where I don't even really see Christmas on the calendar anymore. Like, it's there and I'm sure that'll be a lovely day, but I'm already thinking past that to the middle of January and that must be even more the case for you. So... Uh, diving straight in how are we feeling about it how are you feeling about january are you excited nervous what what does that pre-spine feeling feel like for you yes um it's it's full of excitement to be honest i'm looking forward to getting back to edale and trying to put myself through the spine again i think the delayed gratification is is, is built up over the last three years to try and reach the the wall in Kirk Ghetto in my best possible uh, uh, time, and and so yeah, I'm looking forward to having that opportunity to try and cover the distance and and reach Kirk Ghetto. And so are we. I was so excited when I when I saw that your name was back in the mix for this as well. I am. Um... I know that, you know, it hasn't gone entirely to plan when you've previously had a go at this. You know, we we could say you've done a couple of sort of very, you've done a couple of race day reckies. Yeah, that's that's got to stand you in some some good stead for this one. I imagine there have been some lessons through this slightly longer than intended journey. So, I mean, if you're happy to talk about it, what what has gone wrong in the past and how are you feeling about that going into uh, going into the attempt this year? Yeah, I guess there's been a a problem solving couple of years really of me trying to work out not just spine but generally some longer ultras in the last two years of of why have I been grinding to a halt and um, you know and that's been going through a process of you know is it my chimp? You know, I think there was definitely an element of me and Damon racing too hard at the first year. Um, we at the spine for me, um, and ending up just burning out before I even got to Hawes. Um, with with uh, nausea and muscle problems, I think that you know that was a a good learning curve in itself. Um, you know, and then you go. And you start to try and rule out some of these these problems. You know, last year we definitely were relaxed, we were controlled. There was a big group heading for the first few hours, and then you know, eventually thinned out, and um, and the pace seemed to be be good, and nutrition was going well, and and but yeah, I I've been suffering with kind of race ending muscle problems, you know, in after a set duration in a lot of long endurance races. So it's been trying to look, we are, why, why, why are my muscles, you know, just sort of seizing up more than it, it's, it's a, been a hard process because there's that, okay. Yeah. Muscles hurt. They get fatigued. They get tired. It's, it's a long way, but it, it's, 
gone beyond that point that it's it's a oh i really can't move that fast at all anymore compared to previous experiences of long events where yeah and you're not moving as fast but you're still able to move with progress and and come through that the other side and i think what was it the utmb in august was kind of a, a crunch point where i only actually made it maybe three four hours into the race so barely 20 miles in and then suddenly bang the wheels had come off totally in terms of um the muscle system and it didn't matter he it, it was just i was totally depowered and, and it was it, you know it was kind of like well i've tried all the the basic <laughs> problems here um it, it was like okay let's have another reflect let's ha- think through the the problems um and eventually i've come to the conclusion that potentially it was some medication that i take for cholesterol lowering that could be causing in under these circumstances for the muscles to finally go no enough enough i'm gonna switch off and not give you the the power we're out and the strength and we're out we're protecting ourselves here and um mm. So I can't imagine that was an easy diagnostic process to figure that out either. Like, as you say, it'd be easy to go, well, it's a long way, you know, legs hurt. But as you've just said, 20 miles in, we we know you've got a lot more than that in your legs. So there there must be something else to look for. But how do you even begin to pick all that apart? Yeah, I guess it's the coming to the most obvious thing that's left. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> when when you when you ruled out and gone through the process in the two years of right let's try and eliminate this thing let's make sure this is on point and then when you're still having the same problem you you come back to okay it could be this this is the most likely cause now we've got to try and rule that out i guess the the point of not wanting to rule that out before is because the reason you're on that medication is for more uh, health benefits in terms of, of course. you the, the the point of getting the cholesterol lower is yeah. to improve your cardiac risk for long term um, uh, duration benefits in, in lifespan. Uh, so you you kind of go right. <laughs> let's let's leave that. Um. But coming back to that, going, right, let's test that, come off the that particular medication, and then the difference within two weeks of muscular feeling in terms of in hard training or running down a hill and then not having wooden legs for two days and then actually recovering in a normal time horizon to show progress in strength training for adaption actually getting stronger rather than doing the work and just staying where you are you and suddenly you start to see okay i'm actually able to race hard and still train the next day which you you start to remember those feelings of okay (laughs) this is how it should feel like oh man that must have been a joy to come back to Yes. So in in terms of positivity going into the spine, it's given me, okay, I'm now responding perhaps better to the training that I'm doing, that hopefully if I manage all the other variables that I've learned <laughs> in other events, yeah. that, that I can then reach Kurt Yeto um, yeah, you know, I mean, no illusion that there's still going to be sore muscles and achy ankles and, and then potential nausea and sleep deprivation and cold and wind and rain and, and, and hardship. Yeah. But I've got hope that that I've actually now potentially got capacity to deal with those issues. That's excellent. That's really, really good news. I'm very, very glad to hear that. And 
I mean that that must have been a good moment. That that the realization that I think I found it. I think I I think I know what the issue was, and and I can see that we've made a positive change here. I get it, that's a a great sort of platform to jump off into the spine race. Um, and I mean to dig into the spine itself for people on the outside of this. You got to think there'll be some people listening to this podcast who. And I get it. I, I came into the ultra running scene as a fanboy who could not believe that there was this almost secret world out there of people doing absolutely superhuman stuff. And there are people who are going to be listening to this who it's unthinkable and unfeasible for them to run this far. And it, it would be easy to look at the spine race from the outside and just see the difficulty and the hardship. So what is it that makes you want to come back and and test yourself against it again why why the spine and and why keep coming uh i guess for me it's the adventure meaning the um, the outcome is uncertain so i'm exploring the uncertainty of trying to get to the other end um and and i guess there's also that element of performance that's always integrated within me that I'm, I am competitive. So it's not just about the distance. It's also about out doing it in the best possible effort that I can, um, wherever that leaves me. And, and that's what kind of brings me back to it. Um, Fantastic. Because it, because I haven't achieved it and I haven't <laughs> reached the end and and that always drives me to get better and grow oh uh, yeah I can imagine there's a it, obviously there's the uh, element there of some unfinished business to to come back and get done and um you gotta believe we're going to be very heavily invested in you in the background as well uh, <laughs> I I can't remember if it was you or it was just around that time but I I, I know I remember one of your previous attempts at this and it just felt like anybody in the top 10 could go at any moment and it, one at a time people just kept dropping out and it was either i think it was you somebody woke me up from a nap to say that you'd just gone out of the race and i pushed a chair over and could get so, so frustrated i was like oh no it can't be don't do that to me it's like don't think for a second we're not hugely invested behind the scenes in in you getting through this so yeah i'm I'm really looking forward to seeing you in edale again um and you know it's easy to talk about the spine as a tough challenge it, it, there must be stuff you look forward to as well like what are the what are the positives out there is it is it the course that brings you back or what what is it that you enjoy about this that is a very hard question <laughs> Aha, and first thing in the morning as well and first thing in the morning, you know, because if you unpick it, there's a lot of unpleasant things in it. Absolutely. But, yeah. but sometimes it's that the hardship and the adversity that sometimes makes you feel most alive and um, takes, it strips you down to some degree, doesn't it? Into that you're just focusing in on that moment. You're not worried about anything else that's happening but getting through that storm and crossing those boggy fields uh climbing up the steep hillside it you uh, you're just in that moment of right and that and that process so it's all absorbing into yeah that basic um survival part of of life that strips everything else away um there's also the camaraderie um a shared experience that's you know, really a key part of it you know the, the annual sharing under miles with with damon um as as we traverse up the uh Pennine way and getting to catch up from a previous time that we shared some miles and um, you know and that feeling of yeah we're all this in this together um well, as well as still competing against each other, you know, there's still that element of um, bonding that it's it's not just competition. It is uh, 
about getting the best out of yourself and and shared experience yeah I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that like i think obviously it's a different experience for me i'm i'm charging around with a camera or hunkered over a laptop for 18 hours at a time i'm not out on the course but that, that sense of community and of there being sort of one single focus that everyone's just united behind people behind the scenes just call it the spine bubble and 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 it is it's it's a absolute pleasure to be involved in um and, and that's interesting really from from your point of view as as an athlete it, it, does that experience help you as you're going up the way i i, I know it seems ridiculous that you know, a, a cup of tea or a kind word could turn a whole race around. But the the volunteers, the Spine family, and that sense of community is that is that something that that helps you as an athlete along the way? Oh yeah, I mean it's it's as you're running along, you know, that early time and there's people cheering out the windows that have grown up with the event and know it's on and it's built and and then you can just see the that it's so big concept of running the spine or the Pennar way in winter that people can just appreciate it and and that awe and wonder of of what you're doing and then the support that comes um through and then then actually that kindness um that's uh, all those intermediary kind of checkpoint places as well that are built up in the tradition of the spine the the, the guys at Craven that yeah. come out and uh, put on the the um the tri club one there that's just you know it's at a point where it's just really nice and it kicks you on the way it's getting up towards malum which then helps you move on towards fours and um and and then i can imagine it's that same that up at the other end towards honeystead farm that you know that have built into the the kind of um, or you know people in Slaggyford after Olsen that <laughs> you know uh, will come out and cheer or you you know it's all day and to, night yeah day and night that does make a difference um and and it's, yeah it's really really good part of of the race experience and I imagine the checkpoint teams too like it, it, there's such a rare pit stop on a race of this length so that's got to make a difference the sort of the the passing through there and just the the assistance that you get yeah no for, for sure it's it's the uh attention you get um you know maybe at the front end because we're the first in or you know everyone's ready and enthusiastic and in in the middle zone it might be a slightly different story when there's a bit more chaos and things but i think generally it's still relatively the same um, yeah absolutely you know, it's it's that point that helps revive so many people that makes them you know, they come in, it's it's a really, really, really long way between those checkpoints and it's a lot of time and even the further back you get that time is expanding. Um so the difference those checkpoints make, you know, people can be on the verge of right, that's it, I'm done and then three hours later with a bit of food, a bit of but care a bit of attention a bit of compassion and and a bit of sleep they're, they're persuaded to turn around carry on um and the whole race is turned around and then they reach the finish line um and that's usually the difference of someone at one of those checkpoints that's taking the time and the passion to really try and help that person pass that difficult point sometimes it, it's not though it's you know but it's that person trying that really counts um, yeah. and giving giving that person the op- the most opportunity to get past a difficult spot um, and those what those checkpoints really are good at yeah i completely agree and i uh, sorry you're um you're getting hit with questions about this because i'm i'm sort of been writing about the volunteers and stuff this morning so it's fresh in my mind <laughs> But to um to get back to the race a little bit um and you know to draw back into the the challenge of the race a little bit 
what what's the sort of toughest aspect of doing something like the spine race for you i and i'm sure that's that's different for every athlete but what's what's the hardest thing for you to overcome going into this for me i think there's there's, there's two really hard bits um one is the sleep deprivation aspects of multi-day events um you know i haven't really reached that point on the spine yet but on previous like northern diverse or the many adventure races i've done previously it's you know it's those second third nights or where you try and push the envelope of where you want to not sleep that it just really plays havoc with your your mind getting hallucinations the deja vu the uh the falling asleep on your feet it, it's those moments of hardship that are really difficult to differentiate from reality <laughs> when and, and and keep moving because it's it you know once you're certain past a certain point a checkpoint you, you've got no choice but to try and push through to get to the yeah. next joint point and deal with it and and i think that is one of the biggest uh challenges that you can't practice <laughs> until you're in in the moment in the race because you just can't do it unless you're in yeah. a multi-day uh race and there's no point doing it in training because it's just bad for your body bad for training <laughs> oh so, yeah absolutely it's a difficult it, thing to prepare for physically yeah. and and mentally and practically like how how are you going to fit that sleep deprivation into a functioning training cycle and probably having a family to interact with in a full-time job like you know, that's incredibly difficult the only way to do it is to be like in keith or claire banworth and, and do just do lots and lots of long races <laughs> and yeah and have have better experience of how you handle it um to, to the best of that you know that works for you um are there any so particular it's... tactics you'd use in race when you're experiencing those sort of those those worst moments those moments where your brain and body are screaming at you to go to sleep for a while uh, i think the classic power nap is the the best way isn't it it's the, and in a race like this you've you've got no choice but to keep it short because you just get cold if you if you stop for too long but i think just Planning a little bit of shelter and closing the eyes for five minutes just gives your mind enough of a break just to give you yourself the chance of battling on it again. Um, and I think that's that's the only thing that you, you can do without actually taking a longer sleep. Yeah. Which outside of outside of the world of ultra running, that that sounds crazy as a sick for sort of uh, surviving the world but that five minutes just to reset your brain might be enough to get you that next few miles to the next checkpoint where you can do something a bit more permanent about what you're going through at the moment it's it it, it seems to be sort of often about topping up enough to get you through this moment and it, yeah tough to plan yeah. ahead in a race like the spine further than the next cp really would would that be fair to say yeah uh, I guess the other things you can do is, uh, you know, I obviously shout at myself or, <laughs> you know, if, if I'm shouting at it, you know, it makes it more real rather than doing it in your head. Um, it, so you can sound like a real, any passerby or anyone else close by. <laughs> yeah. You're shouting at yourself. Uh, and we've heard plenty of me. that. We, yeah. We've got it, plenty it of works. video of John Kelly screaming to himself in the early hours of the morning and people singing at the tops of their voices out in the yeah. middle of nowhere. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. Something to just focus your mind and project out some energy seems to wake people up just that little bit. Yeah. I, I, I agree with, with, with that one. Yeah. The difficulty with the, the sheet checkpoints being so far apart is, is that. Do you push the boundary and try and get to the next checkpoint, or do you take the sleep now uh, and then benefit from that sleep? You know, it's it's that average pace scenario, isn't it? Which is going to get you the highest average pace? Um, Absolutely. And it's really hard to tell for a, you know the front end 
driving in tours, you know, me and Damon were there at 10 in the morning. It's, to, you know, we've got to make the most of the daylight. But, you know, where does that now put us in to the Middleton checkpoint, which is eight, nine miles further on up the uh, valley now? Uh, does does that have an impact on, <laughs> you know, or do you go the in Keith and take an hour at Hawes to make sure that you're good to get to Middleton? You know, there's so many possibilities. Yeah. Mm. And I think the part of it is you have to react to how you're feeling at that particular point and don't get too sucked into a preset strategy. Have have a toolbox that you can apply and, and then try and, and then live with your decision. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, well, it, that sort of preempted the last thing I've been asking everyone, which is, you know, for, for the guys that are listening to this and going into this challenge for the first time, what what sort of advice might you give? And I, I think you might just have tapped into something pretty valuable there, which is you can't really adhere to a strict plan you made in advance because there are so many moving variables along the way. So it seems more about having a, a good adaptable system but not necessarily a strict plan yeah no i think it's part of it's thinking through potential problems that you may face ahead of time and and then have to think about what are the the scenarios and solutions that potentially to those problems so that you have that um toolbox to think okay what can I do in this this scenario? What options do I have? And then and then it gives you a a, a chance to use that in in practice. Um, you know, there's always going to be a scenario that you haven't thought about that you have to deal with. Um, but by also by having that thought processes, you're already into a system of how do I solve rather than it's it's a barrier too much um to get past uh, and yeah which which you know i i'm one that knows very well in certain moments you, you sometimes don't get past that that barrier um but it's hopefully Definitely. trying to set yourself hopefully trying to set yourself up to overcome it um, to give yourself the greatest future. possible chance yeah well, I think that's very sage advice um, from somebody who would know. And uh, Kim, I'm I'm not going to keep you too much longer. I've got a lot of uh, interviews to fit in, and I just it just sort of remains to say I'm really excited you're going to be there in January, and I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. And it's it's fantastic to hear that you are as well. So thank you very much for this morning. Great. See you in January. Thank you. That you will. See you in Edo. Good afternoon then, John Kelly. John, this podcast is really just becoming a mouthpiece for you now. Um, it's it's a little uncomfortable, but it, but it is lovely to have you back again. How are you doing? Doing very well. How are you doing? So it's still, yeah. still morning here my time, but uh, you didn't wake me up too early, so it's good. Oh, good stuff. Of course. Honestly, it's the spine bubble. This is just an extension of it for me. I forget sometimes that the people I'm talking to are on the other side of the planet. Um, but yeah, good good morning to you, John. Um, I, I'm going to go straight in. It caused a lot of excitement at this end when you sort of broke cover and said that you were going to be coming back to the spine race in January. Um, you know, I've got WhatsApp groups for the media teams and the management team. And yeah, that, there wasn't much else talked about that day. Um, so thank you, firstly, for that. Uh, we're very excited to have you back again. Um, it's going to be great to see you in EDL. Um what happened? What made you break cover in that moment? Or uh, had you always intended to do it? What could you can you talk us through? What's what brought you back to that start line again? Yeah, it was uh, it was quite the, the journey on that decision this year because I'd, I'd been considering it pretty much the entire year uh, ever since a, a bit of FOMO tracking uh, the, the this year's the twenty twenty three spine race. I uh, had been in touch with with Phil, the uh, the race director, most of the year, and. Uh, 
it, it, you know, so I, I had toured as young and, and throughout the year, I was kind of telling myself, you know, I, I really need to decide by the summer at the very latest. But, but then I, I had some things come up in my schedule. I, I had a, a toe surgery, uh, planned for the first week of November. And, and so I told Phil, I was like, what can I, can I see how this toe surgery goes? Um, uh, let you know, as, as soon as possible after that. Also seeing that, you know, that the, the Western States and, and the hard rock lotteries, um, which, you know, those are the, the two big ones here in the U S and, and I've been trying to get into Western States since, uh, 2016, I, I believe. Wow. Been unsuccessful in the lottery, unsuccessful in a, in a couple of, uh, golden ticket attempts. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that, I, I mean, not that it's, it's, it's a higher priority than the spine, but when you have that shot, you just, you have to take it. Uh, yeah, I understand, dude. We know yeah. we're not the only race in the world. Um, so was, was waiting on that. Did, didn't get into hard rock, didn't get into Western States. My, my toe surgery, uh, seems to have gone well. Uh, so, you know, it was, uh, time to, to make the decision and, uh, looking forward to, to getting back and, uh, being back on that terrain, back in that community, um, back with, uh, some, some good competition this year as well. Yeah, it's a strong roster, right? We, it, there's there's some very very familiar names on there, and familiar because they've troubled uh, troubled the spine podium quite a number of times. It's I, obviously I'm skirting around here saying Damian Hall, who I'm going to be interviewing later in the week. Was was that at all a factor, knowing that he was going to be back here again? That it, there's sort of quite a lot out there bigging up a rivalry between you two. What's uh, What's, had, what's the deal there? Does that is, is that attractive to you? Damien and others, for, for sure. You know, at, at this stage in my career, while I'm still trying to compete, it's, you, you know, it, you need people to compete against if you're going to do that. And so if, if this were uh, me coming back for a stroll along the Penine Way in, in January, I would have as much value to me. I, I do think that there are, you, you know, it, as far as my own personal results there, there's certainly a lot that I've learned, um, in many different areas since my, my first uh, run at the spine back in, in 2020 before the world, just before the world shut down. Uh, so I, I do want to get back and, and to just to achieve a better personal outcome and, and see what I can do with those lessons learned, but also having uh, some, some friendly competition there makes it much more meaningful and, and also, uh, really helps drive towards those personal goals as a, as a big motivating factor, knowing that he's either next to me or breathing down my neck or out in front of me to, to chase. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I have to lean into the rivalry angle. That seems to be the way that the, uh, popular ultra running press is is lean in with with the story between you two but i i love to see it as you say the the stronger the roster is the the harder you guys all pussy push each other and the the more exciting the race is from from my side of things where you know you guys give me an incredible story to tell and i'm very much looking forward to that now this being you know it absolutely not your first time at this and you having done so well when you were here before is there anything that's changed between then and now is there anything that you've learned or that you think you are stronger at as a runner now than than when you sort of set the men's course record uh, absolutely i i mean both in in terms of doing these types of events and in, in general and uh specific knowledge of of the penine way i, I mean that was really my I, I'd done the Shidi goat race just before that, but, but otherwise I hadn't seen any of the benign way and, and it showed, I, I got lost for significant chunks of time, a significant number of times. Uh, most of those were, were coming into or, or, or leaving villages. I, I do fine out on the trails, but you know, once I'm on roads that, uh, it, it all gets confusing and, and unnatural. So I, I took a, a very long r wrong turn uh coming out of pause for example um but th that's that's the first time i think someone caught me uh it, it, well no actually it, 
a, a wrong tar going into the first uh, checkpoint as well. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I, I've, I've certainly spent some more time on the nine way. I, I, I know the route. I, I know what I need for each section. Uh, that was also an issue the first time. I, I didn't quite take everything that I needed for each section uh, because I misremembered in my head uh, what each section w would have. Uh, I'll, I'll be cracking, you know, that things things go as planned here. I'll be cracking the thousand mile mark on the Penine Way uh, with, with this race. Um, and outside of that, just these types of races in general, you know, I'm, I'm known for doing these long multi-day things and, and miserable conditions. Um, but I, you know, I hadn't done much, um, kind of beyond the, the 60 hour, uh, before this, I, I'd done, uh, Tour de Jean. My, my first Tour de Jean was, was a few, um, few months before that but but otherwise uh I, I hadn't done these things where you, you kind of push past that threshold of uh being able to exist on solely on power naps or maybe on nothing at all 60 hours is kind of that threshold for me so once you get past that in terms of strategy uh it's it's a different world uh, the, the 16 hours of darkness per day, uh, dealing with the, the cold and, and the wet conditions. These were all, uh, pretty new things for me uh, at the time. I, I didn't, it was only a month earlier on that shitty, shitty goat race that I, I truly learned what a bog was. Uh, so, you know, what one is now. Yeah. A thousand I'm miles quite, of way. Quite, quite familiar with them. Uh, so, you know, it's it, d definitely a a different race for me, uh, from a number of angles. And, and that's one reason that I want to go back and, and see what I can do, uh, given those lessons that I've learned since then. I, I mean, you mentioned then that you seem to have garnered a bit of a reputation for doing extremely long distances in pretty horrible conditions. Um, I mean, I think largely that might be as a consequence of having chosen to do quite a lot of stuff in the UK and us just generally having terrible weather but you know you you've also been through the Barclay a couple of times now it, are you somebody who has just uh, you become adept at enduring those conditions or do you thrive when it gets bad like that because I I've come across some people who it's it's almost like the worse the conditions are the more fired up they feel how, how do you cope with that I think it's a bit of both I think it's it's a bit of enduring them it's a bit of knowing how to to strategize, to, to kind of play in with them and, and work your way around them. Uh, and a lot just getting used to knowing that, like, hey, I'm, I'm in this position and it sucks, but it, it's okay. It, it's going to be all right. You know that you can get through. You know that there's another side to it. it, it you know, it's, it's like watching one of my kids play sports or run and and the very second that they start to feel any fatigue they're like oh no i have to stop because they've they've never experienced that before they don't know that when you start to feel tired you can actually keep going for for a while and, and it's okay that's that's part of it uh i, I was actually I, I had a few rough days with with work last week some some travel and, and some things i had to go to and, and there were like three nights in a row where i got less than four hours of sleep and, and on that third morning I, I woke up and i was like i don't feel as bad as i should i don't know if that's an actual feeling or if it's just that i've gotten used to feeling bad and, and in my mind i kind of put in context that all of these things i've done over that time period it's like all of that would fit within one bark like it's you know this is this is similar to, to how I would be at the end of, of Barkley, but, but even worse. So it, it's, it's definitely kind of a, a shifting of, of what you view as normal. Uh, as far as excelling in those conditions, uh, I think that the thing for me is, is I do view them as, as opportunities. Uh, so mentally, every time there's a new variable, every time there's some new little complexity added, uh, that to me is, is an opportunity. To, to gain and and to differentiate myself I, i'm you know I, i'm by no means a slow runner but i'm also not going to be running the marathon and the olympics uh next year and 
So the, the difference there is, is this isn't just a, a pure foot race. There's so many other variables that you have to take into account. And if I can do just a bit better on each one of those, then that adds up to a, a huge difference. Uh, that's a fascinating way of looking at it, actually, that, you know, if those weather conditions suddenly change and get very bad, let's reframe that. Because if I can cope with that well, then I've got an extra advantage over the person behind me or just in front of me. Um, and I think that might be a useful thing to people to um, try and remind themselves to go to in their heads when they get into that kind of position, because that's, that's a sort of exceptional way of viewing an obstacle that comes up in your path, especially during an event like this where everyone involved in it is under a lot of pressure all the time to to keep on top of their condition, to keep on top of the conditions around them and and keep moving. That's, yeah, it's a fascinating way of looking at it. Yeah, and, that, and one one quick thing that actually is Steve House, uh, is a just incredible mountaineer, uh, wrote training for the athlete with, with Killian. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking to him earlier this year after Barkley, he pointed out to me that, it, you know, it's really those tough conditions. It's those moments that those... Those are the reasons we, we do these things, you know, in, in terms of what we gain from these events, uh, what we learn, uh, what we take away that's that's far beyond just running or wandering around bogs and, and mountains. Uh, the lessons we take away, that those are learned in those toughest moments. So it makes zero sense to encounter those moments and then be like, oh, no, I'm out, I'm done. Uh, uh, like you, you're quitting at the very point that is the reason you're there to begin with. That's a very, very good point. Uh, it just it, the value that you get out of overcoming conditions like that, the 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 value that you can take with you into other other races and other aspects of your life is, um, is massive. Uh, and yeah, it, it, you do seem to be somebody who likes having a problem to solve that it seems a weird thing to say now i say it out loud but i see you as kind of a data-driven person in how you approach things and it 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 makes sense to me that you can look at the conditions like that and go right i can i can spin this i know i can solve this problem and i can make this work for me and that's kind of ruined the last question i was going to ask you because i've been asking everyone sort of what kind of advice would you give to other people that are coming into this for the first time? But that that mindset and that attitude might just be a golden nugget for anyone listening to this. Now, just in case I've skimmed over some other in- incredible nuggets of information in there, um, I'm going to ask that question anyway because I think it's, it's only fair to ask it of you and uh, if I'm asking everybody else. There are going to be quite a lot of people who are listening to this, who are coming into it for the first time. Maybe they're doing the sprint, which is, you know, hugely intimidating if you're new to that distance. You're not going to be getting your hand held. There isn't a checkpoint every 10 kilometers. Is is there a, a, a sort of golden bit of advice that you might give people coming into this for the first time? Um, it, just something that might help them along the way? Well, I... I... That is is typically what I give people going into these sort of things. Just to summarize, I mean, I think the way that Dave Horton put it to me is is it doesn't always get worse. And remember these things, uh, you know, a road race, you kind of start feeling fresh and perfect and you gradually decline until hopefully you hit rock bottom at the finish line. Uh, And these sorts of things, there's a ton of ups and downs. When you're on one of those downs, you have to remember that that you can pop back out. There, There will... It might take a while in the spine, but the sun will come up uh, eventually. Uh, and, it, you know, again, it, em- embrace those difficulties is, is the reason you're out there. That That's what is going to give you the, the biggest sense of achievement. That's what's going to teach you the most that you can take away to the rest of your life. And don't, you know, expect things to, to go wrong. It's uh, in, in any of these, I kind of have a set of things that, uh, I, it's a bit arbitrary how I define these words, but I, here's, here are the things that I'm going to plan. These are the things that I actually have control over the, you know, what I start the race with, uh, it, it, thing, things like that. Um, I, I'm going to focus on those. I'm going to get my plan right. 
And then the other things are, what do I prepare? Where I am trying to envision all of the things that could go wrong, all of the things that could throw me off of that plan, and how am I going to respond to, to each one? Uh, and, and so think about those ahead of time so that when you're out there and you know, your, your jacket wets through or you start to get cold or the wind's stronger than you thought it might be, you know what to do. You've thought about that ahead of time and you know how to react so that you're not standing out there freezing going, what what do I do now? What do I do now? I don't know what to do now. And it, it, you know, it's, I, I think it's also funny that some people, um, I don't think it's been British people that, that, that have asked me this because they've experienced it, uh, the, the terrain more, but I've had people who want to do the spa and ask me like, well, how do you keep your feet dry? You don't, <laughs> but it's, um, unless, unless you're out there in trout fishing waders, you're, you're not going to keep your feet dry. You can get all the Gore-Tex shoes and waterproof socks that you want. Uh, and, and eventually your, your feet are going to get wet. And, uh, so, you know, it's, it's again, expecting that, that those things are going to happen, be prepared for them and just know how you're going to respond so that you're not wasting time trying to come up with your next steps while you're out there and cold and your mind is muddled and, uh, it's dark and, and everything else. And this is it. I mean, you touched on sleep deprivation a little earlier like it's it's not a good time to be figuring these problems out for the first time when you are maybe 24 hours out from the last time you had a decent amount of sleep or more much more at times um extremely difficult under those circumstances i've also i've started preparing myself i'm growing my winter coat here so you you know anything that you can do to uh, Again, just just plan ahead, and, and I mean seriously, th- this is why I have not gotten a haircut in the past month. Is because this will add a little bit of warmth to me when I'm out there uh, running through bogs in January. You heard it, fi- you heard it here first, people. It's Mate, marginal advantage. gains. Grow that hair if you can. Huge advantage over someone who say might have a mohawk out there. Yeah, now that's very true because that doesn't cover much of the head at all, does it? It's, it's somebody with a mohawk out there could become very cold in those hills dangerous oh i'd be worried about that if uh if that was the sort of hair i had um <laughs> now it, it's easy with the spine race to sort of mine into this stuff being prepared for war it's going to be really difficult out there but there's stuff we enjoy about the race right it, it, there there has to be for us to keep coming back in and doing this so what are you looking forward to coming back to the spine race in january I mean, I, I genuinely do miss the, the train and the landscape. I, I know that I'll probably see it about eight hours of the day. But, uh, if you're lucky. Yeah, the, the, being able to experience that and, and really just the, the cross-section of the UK uh, that I haven't seen much of in the past year and a half. Even even running through those those little villages, which are, are so quaint and, and different from, from what I have here. Uh, as long as I don't get lost in them, um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing a number of people uh, that I haven't seen in quite a while. Uh, so that's that's definitely a, a, a big draw for me and something that I, I do believe I'll, I'll genuinely enjoy and genuinely uh, appreciate my experience out there this time. And, and that's been a, a big shift for me and, and a lot of things that I've done. And, and Barclay, for example, where I've, I've gone from having it be this this thing that I'm stressed and, and anxious about and I'm out there thinking of it in, in terms of trying to push through the, the misery and uh you, you know the the end of the spine last time for me was um that that was maybe the the most miserable I, I've been uh in in terms of uh the, the conditions I was in thinking I was going to have a, a kind of sprint finish through through the Sheviats uh and it, it was it was rough um but i've i now i mean like barkley this year i just uh i'm i'm able to enjoy it and, and appreciate that i'm i'm out there and able to do these things uh to begin with and and 
recognizing every time that it might be my last opportunity to do so. We're, we're never guaranteed a, another chance at these things. So uh, enjoy it while we can. Excellent advice again. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned there's going to be quite a few people there you're looking forward to see. Um, I know the spine team are really looking forward to you being back there as well. Um, and I guess that's a factor in it too. Uh, the The sort of wider community I can't wait to receive you back. And I think that's the case for sort of all the athletes that come through. I've, I've never seen so many people merrily serve cups of tea than in these checkpoints. So the, the, the effort that they'll go to at three o'clock in the morning to to look after a runner is is astonishing and that's it, that's got to be a part of it from your side as well as an athlete yeah absolutely just just no tea for me It'll, maybe some oh. hot but you know yeah no worries i'll uh, i'll try and remind the checkpoints of that as i pass through myself look um when you're coming back to the spine race you're you, I can't imagine that you'd be putting yourself back into this again unless you were sort of feeling quite strong and feeling quite well prepared for it. But it, do you even come into a race like this with a with a target or are we just thinking about getting through it and getting through it and feeling like you've acquitted yourself? Uh, I I try not to... And this, uh, again, goes what I was, back to what I was saying about the... the you know, getting overly stressed about these things. I try not to put uh, too many of my eggs in, in one basket these days and, and view any single event as, you know, I have to achieve this outcome and I have to be successful. And, and if not, then it was it was all for not failed. Uh, it, you know, there, there's a lot more uh, to, to take away from it uh, than, than the actual outcome. Uh, everything has to be put in context of, of the conditions that, that you faced. Uh, and in the process you took to get there, uh, as as well as just it, it, you know, kind of looking forward to uh, multiple things throughout the year and, and keeping myself uh, as as fit as possible and, and able to do each of those, uh, rather than having everything build towards one big moment. But I, I certainly do have my have my goals uh, at, at the spine, uh, but but it's it's not. It's, it, it's difficult, you know, I, I have these discrete, very measurable goals that to me are, are highly motivating. Um, and, and that's, that's what I try to focus on going into something, but, but coming out of it, uh, it's, it's, it's a very different analysis in my mind of, of again, uh, looking at the context, looking at the experience and, and I, what I really focus on doing now is, is like Tour de Jean this past year, a, a few months ago. I, I did not have a good race. I did not have a good result. But I, I kind of realized in, in my head that if I can if I can walk away from something like that and say, wow, I I didn't do well, um, but that, that was still a great time. I, I'm glad I did that. That was a, that was a fun adventure. Um, then, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that I want to do. Yeah, excellent. And a, another really useful thing, I think, for people to hear coming into this. Like, again, whether you're doing that sprint distance or you're going for the big spine for the first time, life will go on if you don't get to the finish line this time around. And you will have had an experience and you will have learned a hell of a lot from it and probably drunk quite a lot of tea. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to darken too much more of your day, John. Uh, just to say... We really are looking forward to seeing you in January. And thanks for taking the time out today. It's it's greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank you very much. It was uh, great to chat, and I'll uh, see you soon. Yeah, see you in Edel, bud. Well, good afternoon, then. It's Damien Hall. Damien, how are you? I'm grand, Will. Uh, just been out for a run, got my my uh what's the word yeah um oh what's the phrase i've forgotten well big mug of tea but um um i hadn't forgotten that phrase it was a self 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 parody um something like that yeah no i'm very well how are you i'm very well thank you uh also thanks for getting tea out the way early i knew there'd be a reference to that particular beverage somewhere in this podcast we can put that one to bed straight away that's great 
Um, uh, yeah, I'm very well. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice of you to ask. Looking forward to Christmas. Couple of days to get my breath back before we're straight into the spine race. But if that's preying on my mind, I imagine it's slightly larger looming on your horizon. Um, how are you feeling about January? Do you, at this stage, are you excited to be coming back or do you get a kind of Sunday evening before primary school feeling of dread? <laughs> or, or, or where are you? I'm really excited. Yeah. Um, we often have these exchanges. Every year we, we have this exchange between maybe in the registration, in the morning of the race, people often, there's a comparison of like, is it worse to know what's coming or to not know what's coming? Like which one is, which one is easier on the mind? Um, but honestly, I'm super excited. I, you know, I get classic ultra runners amnesia. Can't really remember any discomfort or uh, pain from my previous, what, four starts and three and a half, uh, well, three completions. Um, and all I'm really excited. Um, yeah, can't wait to get out there. Um, it's um, it is on my mind a lot, but yeah, mostly mostly positive, joyful excitement. I mean, who doesn't love a good soggy bog? Well, exactly. What what else would you be thinking about over Christmas? Um, and you know, you you're gonna get to bump into a lot of people you haven't seen for a while. Like a, a lot of the people that I've interviewed have have brought that up, and and the, you know, that's the same whatever capacity you're coming into the spine race in. Like it, once we get to Edale, it's a it's a little jamboree watching everyone bump into each other. But you got you've got a lot of runners with very familiar names to bump into this time around in Edale. That that roster's looking packed for this year. Um, how are you feeling about the competition? Who's who's on it? Oh, you haven't looked. No, I don't, don't even. <laughs> um, who's who else is running? There, there are other runners. Um, one or two. Yeah, I mean, I try very hard. It's it's not it's not all that helpful to be thinking about other runners. So I, I try very hard to to not think about it but uh, people tell you basically anyway and and then even you know on social media i mean hilariously jack uh you know jack on paper would be my biggest competition he was very close to me th this this year or, or last year um whenever people are listening um uh, but yeah he's been on he's had a he's had a place all year but kept telling me he um wasn't sure whether he's going to do it or not but he's definitely doing it um and i knew yeah came out of place early on so all three of us were, were right back in um, I've known that for a long time, and then, and then, yeah, a few other frenemies have have jumped in, jumped in lately. Um, so it's really exciting. So you can't, you sort of can't avoid knowing who else is going to be there. Um, but yeah, really competitive. I think it's 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 probably, it sounds like to me the most competitive uh, race we've had in the yeah in the men's field. There's at least five previous winners, aren't there? Um, yeah. But yeah, so what part of me is really excited. It is genuinely catching up with friends, both the runners and, and staff. Um, and, then, and then part of me is, yeah, trying not to think too much about the runners I'll be against. But you often don't really, you know, you run a long, you run a long way. You, there's plenty of time to chat and swap snacks and swap sunrise, you know, share sunrises. And, and um, I often forget I'm competing. Maybe I'll be better at this stuff if I, if I yeah. I can't focus a little a differently, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but no, really excited about it ultimately. Yeah. No, uh, it and you know it sounds like a stupid question, but I mean I, I'm really interested in that from from your side of it because from our point of view, each time a new familiar name has been added to that roster, we're just doing more backflips. The the atmosphere behind the scenes at the spine races is, is just so excited at the moment. Um, and you talk about names being added recently. Um, uh, obviously, just before this recording started. I uh, I mentioned that we had somebody in particular who dropped into the race this morning, and I'm furious at myself that I didn't ask while we were recording because um, that news hadn't got to you yet. It's so fresh, but yeah, yeah, have Palanti coming back into uh, to do the Pennine Way again. It's it's a very packed roster, like you say, um, and it 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 had always sort of made me wonder whether that phrase on your mind on the running because to us that's a sort of excitement to you that could be a distraction um do you find that difficult on the run-up to this to to just focus on what you're doing or can you compartmentalize quite well um i've got much better at it i mean i must say i mean i want to i want to do well in the most competitive races while i still can so i would rather you know i'm excited that there are there are 
the great runners, especially at this sort of kind of niche, you know, 200 mile distance, um, you know, you wouldn't expect the same runners here that, that do UTMB. You know, this is a, this is a, a, a special type of long distance ultra running that's different, that has different challenges. Um, and we've got some of the absolute best here. And then we've got, yeah, Eugenie Rossello and, and Ian Keith and Pavel Palonce, um, between them, blimey, how many spine races is that? It, you know, it could even be more than 20. Um, and that's at least, oh, is that at least seven wins between them? And it's almost... Oh, don't make me do maths, but we're not going to the words, yeah. Um, well, Pavel, from memory, I think Pavel's completed it five times. And he's always been first or second. Um, and they almost belong to, I don't want to say they belong to a different era, but but yeah, there was a time when I was more of a dot watcher and um, and, and worked on the race with you, Will, a couple of times with the media team. Um, when those three were the, you know, they were dominating it every year. Um, and, and we're, yeah, we're almost in another stage now where time, times have got a bit, a bit faster. Um, but it is more competitive and, and yeah, and often it's not, it's often not the, as Ian Keith showed, um, uh, last year, 2022, um, which was just such a, such a lesson. So it was wonderful. Uh, well, it wasn't strictly wonderful for me cause I was the one, <laughs> I was the one <laughs> who, yeah. Up, but I'm yeah. glad with hindsight you can see how wonderful it was as yes. a story and experience because yeah, yeah you're right was that was a it was, the, it was the classic hair and tortoise um you know me and Eugenie were well ahead of Ian in fact wasn't he something like eight early on or something you know it, it he didn't look even in the equation and and he just was so smart and so that experience that that being an older head um can really pay off in, the, in these distances so um yeah those guys can all offer something so it's um it's gonna be really intriguing and there's going to be, I mean, there's going to be some carnage. It's going to be, it's going to be fun. Oh, absolutely. I, I am fully, fully expecting I'm going to lose my mind at least a dozen times during that week. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. Um, okay. And, you know, to stop talking about everybody else now, let's, let's focus in on Damo a little bit. Um, how has your preparation for this race been like, and, and what does you preparing for this race look like these days and in fact actually actually well i didn't didn't even really answer your your question on my previous my previous uh waffly ramble um which was yeah how, how do i sort of stick to my own you know not think too much about the others um oh, yeah. i mean i guess actually my dnf in 2022 was a really good lesson because even though it was going the race was going really well and for those who don't know yeah i was sort of um four hours and a four hour lead but i was still i was still thinking too much about the people behind me and i was basically pushing uh, at times when I I didn't need to, and in hindsight, yeah, that, that I exasperated a you know a small niggle became a proper injury because I was still pushing and pushing when I didn't really need to at those moments because I was thinking about the other runners. And this year, um, yeah, I mean towards the end it was very close to me and Jack, but for a lot of that race I really wasn't thinking about other people. Um, I was just thinking how do I get to to Kurt Yetub or or the next checkpoint in the best time for me, you know, and I really wasn't. And and that was really working. So and then yeah, end up end up with with a good result. So I've got that good lesson there of of running my own race as much as possible and not thinking too much about others. And that's 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 really helpful. What was the new question? Oh, me preparation. Right. Um, yes. <laughs> I'll do. I'll always just be one one answer behind. Um, uh, uh, yeah. No. Um, I don't think there's anything that would surprise people other than possibly the odds visit to saunas, but you know, that's my own, my own uh, thing, but, um, getting prepared for the, uh, hot temperatures out there on the trail. Well, it will be, it looks like it will be warmer this year, but you know, three or four degrees warmer or something. Um, um, yeah, no, nothing. So yeah, I did a big race in September. So really it was about recovering from that. So really chilled for a month or so. And then, and then you will have lost some speed and some economy. So it's working back on that. So again, not, not big volume and, and more speed work. And, and actually I did a bunch of local races just to try and get that speed up and just enjoy a different type of running. Um, and then only really, um, from December, late November, December, do you start to get kind of, uh, specific, you know, you enter a specific phase of training and that's when I suppose the long runs come back in and you try and get similar terrain. Um, I mean, normally I don't go up to the Penang Way because um, I've been on it before. Uh, but I did. I have popped up twice this time. Well, once with an athlete and once just to visit a friend, um, and that's that's been nice. Um, but often I can. The Black Mountains are quite near me, and the Brecon Beacons. And they're fairly similar, actually. 
Um, in fact, once a, a year or two ago, I remember putting someone on Instagram, sort of, you know, what's, where is this, the Pennines or the Black Mountains? And I, I think it had more votes for the Pennines. Um, it, it's, it's fairly similar. Um, so, yeah, and I'm right in the middle of that now. Um, long run yesterday, so a medium long run today. Going to Black Mountains tomorrow, actually, for a, a, another long run. So this is peak peak training um, before I can settle in. Yeah, settle into a big uh, a big feast at Christmas. Yeah, I was going to say, do you give yourself much of a break over Christmas? And uh, we've we've got so many competitors out there right now who must be spending their Christmas <laughs> nervous as hell, waiting for the spine race in January. Well, will you at least get a bit of a break between here and there? Uh, not really. Um, well, I, I guess from this that's dedication, <laughs> sir. <laughs> um, there are mince pies out there. There are. Um, I mean, look, for example, like, I mean, I rarely, when I'm training for a big race, I rarely drink alcohol for starters. So I'm, so I'm pretty boring. Uh, anyway, as you, as you can tell from this conversation. Um, and then, and then sort of next week, this week's peak training, but next week, which is Christmas week. Um, yeah, I'd still train. There'll still be probably 70, 70, 80 miles of, of running. Um, but yeah, hopefully not much work. So you've got time to relax and recover and and yeah plenty of eating you know if you don't fuel your training you're just going to break so yeah i definitely enjoy i let myself have a good old feast um so in that so i guess yeah no alcohol but plenty of food and plenty of training but also plenty of plenty of dad jokes and and that sort of stuff too i'm oh, perfect I'm, I'm glad you're getting some of that at least i was mainly trying to gauge how bad i needed to feel while i was sat in my udi on the sofa um but yeah good to know you won't be freezing to death the whole time um, look, it, it, you have a pretty unique perspective on the spine race. You've kind of seen it from a lot of angles over the years. Um, and people are listening to this partly due to, you know, the hype, the, the names on the roster, but also I know that anybody who's entering this race or thinking about entering this race pours over every podcast and blog looking for little useful nuggets of information. So is there anything you've accumulated over your your years of contact with the spine race that you think would be useful for these incoming debutante spiners to know? Uh, could be boggy out there. Um, yeah, I mean, no, there's a few. Fact, really <laughs> accurate. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a few little, I think, helpful mantras that. Um, or phrases that could be helpful. I mean, one is kind of, you know, feet and eat, uh, which is quite nice and memorable. I mean, you know, foot care is, is huge. And if you do that right early on, then, you know, as in, as in the first major checkpoints you come to really take the time. If you, if you, you know, if you need to get some taping and plasters on, they get them on They take the extra 10 minutes, get, you know, if there is a medic available to do that, you know, get them done properly, especially at, especially at say halls where, you know, you're only a third into the race really. Um, yeah, take the time with your feet and then, you know, eat is, is kind of obvious, but it gets harder and harder. You know, you got off food, but the, the, the fact I always remember and trying to remind people of is 20% of the calories go to your brain. So if you're not getting the food in, you're less motivated, you're making less good decisions. Um, so you're fueling, you're fueling your mind. Um, so that's important feet and eat. And this came from, um, got one more but i've totally nicked it from someone else from one of your previous podcast interviews uh be bothered was that sharon sharon gator was it last year's so no that yeah that was really good be bothered so that means if your hands getting cold but your mittens are in the in your in you know you'd have to take your pack off to get the mittens out and you can't really be bothered be bothered and and certainly with eating with getting your feet sorted yeah be bothered um with with changing the head torch battery now rather than waiting till it totally dies, changing the GPS batteries, you know, just be bothered. Um, those things, the people who look after themselves in the first kind of half early on, you know, they're going to be the ones going strongly later on. Um, so those, I think those are useful. Again, I might not have actually answered your specific question, but I've, I've said some hopefully useful things. Oh, I think you very much did. Um, although I know I'm going to go away from this interview now, absolutely kicking myself because I can't remember who said that. Um, I think it was, yeah, I'll have to go check that. I, I, you know, whatever. It sound advice, whoever said it, and we'll uh, we'll get it printed on a banner to go somewhere in Edale. Um, yeah, no, that's exactly what I was looking for, and I appreciate it. Thank you. 
um i you know i I also have tried to make a point of talking to people in these interviews a little bit about what's good about the race. You know, there's always a lot of talk with the spine about how hard it is, how difficult it is. The word suffering comes up pretty regularly. Um, and, it, you know, how much preparation has to be done to get in there. But if if all it was was grueling and horrible, then people wouldn't come back. So what, what else are you, what are you looking forward to? um uh, when you get there in january well i think there's at least yeah there's at least sort of two different categories and, and one is is i suppose the, the the human side of of just there is you know without going too too soppy you know that there is a wonderful community around the race um it's 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 the staff and volunteers um who it could be just incredible but also there, there are just these kind of there's this culture of almost pop-up pop-up strangers just appearing um, in the middle of nowhere, um, just to give you, you know, a, a, an encouraging word or or, or, a, or a cup of Haribo or a cup of a cup of tea, and either you know people yeah you know, turn up, but also people on the route. That's it. That's becoming a phenomenal thing, isn't it? Each little village now seems to have a sort of um, designated angel. You know, the angel of Slaggy Ford, the angel of Honeystead, Honeystead, um, all these great names too. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah, that's just wonderful. So, and, then, and then for me, yeah, meeting so many people, I see, I suppose, often once a year at this race, saying hello again. Um, that's wonderful. So there's the whole hu- sort of human side. And then for me, there's the um, definitely the scenic side. And, and yeah, the Penang Way isn't everyone's cup of tea. It isn't gorgeous from beginning to end. Um, but it does have special moments. Um, I mean, High Cup Nick is, is one of the most underrated sort of natural features in, in all of all of all of Britain, I would say. Um and twice in previous races I've I've arrived at it covered in snow. No, sorry, I wasn't covered in snow, but it was covered in snow um at dawn um two times. Um if my race is going well I Wow. Yeah, I, I it'll be in the dark this time, but as as the last two times. But but that that can be really amazing. And then you get these unexpected things that I guess weather phenomenons and um going over Crossfell in, in twenty twenty three that was really special. It, it was at least minus 10 with the wind chill, but it meant the, the sort of ice, you know, the wind sort of sculptures the ice across the rocks. So there were all these crazy patterns. I was up there on my own and it was just after, it was just kind of dawn or just after dawn. Um, and the sky was kind of pink. Um, and it, I felt like I was in a, I don't know, a, 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 a bowl or a tent or something. It was like this cloudy pink. And I just, I've never experienced that anywhere uh, and if an alien had sort of popped out of somewhere it just would have seemed totally totally fitting and i probably wouldn't have been surprised uh, i mean when i got to greg's hut i mean it did you know it did feel you know meeting john bamba is is um uh, not sure where i'm going with that but but uh, <laughs> it can be an otherworldly experience as well um but but yeah just those wonderful crazy strange moments um blankensop often throws things up that you can you know struggle to remember clearly but because by that stage you're chronically sleep deprived, um, but yeah, you'll just those magical moments with with nature, I suppose, as well. So yeah, those are the two categories where I'm certain there'll be moments of moments of joy and happiness. Well, that's good to know. There has to be some levity out there, and yeah, had those aliens turned up at that point with that level of sleep deprivation, there's there's every reason to think you wouldn't have known whether that was really happening or not. Yes, uh, there's always a risk of that. Um, and it, now, look, obviously, I often feel a bit awkward when I come into these interviews before the race because, I, you know, I'm trying to tease out a little bit of ooh, who's competitive, who's aiming for what. Is there anyone coming into this thinking they're, they're going to nail it, we're going to win this year or anything? And you guys are really difficult to tease that kind of position out of. Um, I managed to get a little bit of mild ribbing from John Kelly about something to do with Mohicans. I, but, you know, I keep... I, I, it was mild. It was mild. It wasn't the uh, the the spicy, you know, vein of media content that I was hoping for. Um, it, it's such a friendly community. I think it's difficult for me to dig for, and I might just have to give this up every year. But having added all those caveats, are you going into this with any expectation of what the result might be, or or do you try and insulate yourself from that? Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm afraid the 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 best sort of the best sort of answer is kind of the boring thing that that uh, 
you know, there's part, there is part of my mind wanting to give you, give you the answer you, you, you possibly crave or, or, or would, or would, or would make this podcast uh, that our listeners are yearning for. <laughs> I'm desperate to beat John Kelly, that rascal. Um, but I don't need to, cause I beat him in the last race quite badly. So I don't need to say so. <laughs> um, although he did beat me in the previous race, um, on, on his home patch, uh, convincingly. So we're having quite, we're having quite a fun. In fact, yeah. So we, so we had these sort of FKT to and fros um, in 2020, 2021, and and he has had the last or latest laugh there. And then we've only actually raced each other twice in in direct races, and it's kind of one apiece um, there. Um, so it'd be yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens here. I guess we know each other quite well. We know each other's strengths and weaknesses. My weakness, obviously, being my haircut. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, on paper, I mean, Jack Jack's got a faster time on on the Penaway Winter than the, the John, um, and, and there are some other very good runners. Yeah, two previous. Again, I, I haven't looked at the uh, <coughs> roster at all. Don't know anyone. Oh, no. But there are two previous Dragons Back winners, I believe. Uh, so they'll be they'll be fast. Um, so yeah, there are loads of strong male runners who could do well, and and the, the female field is more stacked than ever as well. Um, including a couple of top athletes of mine. Um, Indeed. So, yes, I don't know if that qualifies as banter, but that's all I'm giving you. But but all, you know, all I should be thinking of really is is trying to get to get to the finish at the best possible time for me, um, drinking as much tea as I possibly can. And I have ensured John's preference, for those who don't know, is for iced tea, and, and I have checked, and that is not available at the checkpoints, uh, which is a great show, it really is. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I think that was pretty much exactly what I thought I would get, and there you go. I, you know, if this was a sort of more supercharged American style boxing sort of type of a thing, we might be able to talk that up. But I cannot get any of you ultra runners to uh, to commit to a proper rivalry. It's all very, very English. Um, but yeah, I don't, even John. I mean, Kelly. the field also, also. I mean, the field is so stacked this year. I mean, it. it I, I've studied this race like you have. I'd say it's the most competitive field for the men. Oh, I can't get anybody to commit to a sweepstake behind the scenes. Uh, nobody. Uh, uh, nobody at all. Um, uh, there are just well, I must say, I mean... That have got a stake in it, yeah. But also, yeah, I mean, you could concentrate on me and John. We may, we both, we may both not finish. We may both not even be in the top three or even five, to be honest. The, the, the field's that good. Um, so it'd be a mistake for me to, yeah, concentrate on him or, or anyone else. I just keep saying Jack's known to heat pressure on him. Um, and you never know. I mean, Kim Kim Collison's going to get this race right one day. Um, and then there's the Ian Keith scenario, isn't there? Where we'll just explode and then he poodles, poodles through again. Like like the old, uh, yeah, the, the old war horse that he is. Um, or, or, or Eugene, he finally nails it. Or, you know, Pavel on the comeback trail. Um, yeah, absolutely. Claire Banworth has been indestructible over the last 12 months as far as i could tell we might need an armored personnel carrier to stop her out there i you know there are there are a lot of strong performers out there not trying to build up the tension for you but i am so excited about this race in january um and very appreciative uh, of you to uh take some time out today to have a chat with me um i'll be going straight off the end of this interview into christmas so thank you very much for being my uh last sort of Official sure. workish related, yeah, d- dreary chore of the year. Uh, greatly appreciated. No problem at all. Uh, see you in uh, yeah. See you in January.